The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Thank you for joining us today at the ANA's eLearning Academy. My name is Andy Dickus, and although my background says otherwise, I'm here at ANA headquarters in Colorado Springs. And uh, today should be a very an interesting presentation. I'd like to thank the Gray Sheet, first of all, for their continued support of our e-learning offerings. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, my coworker, longtime coworker, Rod Gillis, who will be giving a presentation on commemorative coins and what it takes uh, to uh, getting a commemorative coin made. I've been working here with Rod uh, for 15 years and uh, I know he's going to be talking at least a little bit about uh, the coin that he uh, was uh, integral in creating, the World War I commemorative from 2018. Um, and I kind of followed him along the whole process, which took years and years. So I'm kind of looking forward to getting an in-depth uh, 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 idea of what uh, the, the process is. And I know it's not a simple one. So um, with the uh, presentation, if you have a question specifically for Rod, can you put that in the Q&A function? And then if you just want to make uh, just comments or talk shop, talk coins, you can use the chat function for that. So without further delay, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Rod and uh, it should be a good one. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I appreciate uh, the kind introduction. Um, as Andy stated, my name is Rod Gillis and I'm the education director at the American Numismatic Association. And today, um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about commemorative coins, which I really do enjoy, and what is involved in getting a commemorative coin minted. You know, when we take a look at uh, commemorative coins, um, we often, you know, decide whether we like it or not by the design, and then the subject matter comes into play. Uh, but th really, that's only uh, a small portion of it that there's a lot involved in getting a commemorative coin minted. So today we're gonna to take a look at a little bit of the history of commemorative coins, and then we're gonna spend some time um, discussing what, the, uh, what is involved in getting a commemorative coin made. And uh, I hope to have uh, some time at the end of the presentation <clears throat> so that if you have any questions, we can uh, spend some time talking about it. So let's get started. By definition, commemorative coins are minted to celebrate or observe a historical person or event. And uh, this is really one of the uh, first uh, commemorative coins. Uh, this is called the Eidmar. And uh, this is a coin that was actually uh, minted to celebrate the death of Caesar. And you can see on the reverse, uh, there are daggers and there's a, um, a freedom slave uh, cap. And what the whole idea behind this coin was that we have indeed killed Caesar who was tyrannical and uh, Rome is now freed of his tyranny. And we did this on the Ides of March. So this uh, coin talks about uh, not only a specific date but it talks about a, a specific event. We can place United States commemorative coins in two basic categories. We can talk about the classic series, and we can also talk about the modern series. Here's an example of a coin from the classic series. It's the 1936 Battle of Gettysburg anniversary, and there were indeed a very few um, Civil War veterans who were still alive in 1936. And there was a, uh, at Gettysburg, there was a um, sort of a reunion and the final reunion and of the blue and gray. And um, what is interesting about that is that um, the coins that were minted from this uh, event, that um, some of them found their way to the uh, soldiers, uh, both of the blue and gray who attended uh, that final reunion. Uh, you didn't, at that reunion, you didn't necessarily have to be uh, a, a soldier who was at the Battle of Gettysburg. They were just looking for soldiers who had been involved in the Civil War itself. One of the reasons that uh, coins from the classic uh, period 
or minted were as uh, souvenirs. And here's an example of an exposition souvenir. Many commemorative coins were issued as souvenirs to defray the cost of expositions, which were popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And this is a uh, half dollar that was minted from the Pan Pacific uh, Exposition in 1915, a particularly beautiful coin. And uh, this is uh, one that was used to help defray the costs of the exposition itself. The coin has an S mint mark, you can see at the bottom. Uh, next to 1950. So that means that it was minted in San Francisco, which makes sense because the Pan Pacific was very close to there. Another reason for uh, commemorative coins in the classic series were to pay for celebrations in and outside of expositions. And uh, here's an example of that. States and cities often needed a way to finance their celebrations the proceeds collected from the Maryland tercentenary was used to finance a celebration in Baltimore in 1934. And you can see on there that that's Cecil Calvert, who was um, uh, part of the whole idea of the state of Maryland. And uh, this was a half dollar to commemorate uh, Calvert and the 300th anniversary of Maryland and uh, it was used to pay for uh, the parade and, and celebrations that took place in Maryland at the time. There were some real legitimate subjects, at least at the beginning of the uh, classic series. Uh, several subjects were well worth commemorating. This uh, half dollar known as the sesquicentennial of American independence was issued to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Now, if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, commemorative coins, this one they made a lot of, so I'm sure that you're uh, familiar with that. But if you're not, you'll see that there are two people on the coin. Obviously, the one in the forefront is George Washington, uh, but the person in the background is uh, Calvin Coolidge. And what made this sesquicentennial commemorative so interesting is that uh, Calvin was very much alive when this coin was minted. As a matter of fact, Calvin Coolidge was the president of the United States when this coin was minted. And I believe he was offered the very first coin that was struck to commemorate the event. Um, you know, the, the idea that you have to be a dead president is just not true uh, when appearing on a United States coin. And, and this is a, uh, an example of that. Although it's probably true to say that there it was easily, you could easily mistake uh, Calvin uh, for being dead. He was a man of very few words uh, while he was president. There's a wonderful story that I love to tell about uh, Calvin Coolidge eating at a state dinner. And there's a woman sitting next to him and all evening, she's trying to engage Calvin in a conversation, and he just plain ignores her, won't say a word to her. Finally, at the end of the evening, she um, says to the president, she confesses, she says, um, Mr. President, I have a $50 bet with a girlfriend of mine that I could get you to say at least three words. Won't you help me? And uh, uh, President Coolidge looks at her and says, you lose. So <clears throat> he was known as a man for very few words, but he does appear on this very significant coin. Here's another example of a legitimate subject that was uh, minted during the classic period. This half dollar known as the Pilgrim Tercentenary was issued to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. And so you see here, an ex example of that coin, which again is a uh, fairly common coin as commemorative coins go. They, they made quite a few of these, um, but this was an example uh, of a commemorating a, a very important subject in our nation's history. Unfortunately, during the classic commemorative time period, um, increasingly, uh, what happened was there were subjects that were a little questionable. Not all commemoratives sold well. Uh, this was because the subject was small in scope, 
or it celebrated a subject that we may find silly today. Um, this is an example of the Bridgeport, Connecticut Centennial, which features, of all people, P.T. Barnum. So that's a wonderful trivia question. If you wanted to ask someone, did P.T. Barnum appear on a United States coin? I'm sure that most people would say, no, that's ridiculous. But there he is on the Bridgeport, Connecticut. Now, what's particularly interesting about this coin, as I, I think that it retailed at the time that it was minted in 1936 for $3, which uh, doesn't seem like very much today. Uh, but I would imagine that P.T. Barnum was probably rolling in his grave um, saying, truly, a sucker is born every minute when someone is paying $3 for a half dollar or 50 cent coin. And then, of course, there were controversial subjects, not so much then, but more so today. Some of the classic commemorative subjects may even seem controversial compared to today's standards. The Stone Mountain Memorial was minted to help pay for a sculpture of Confederate soldiers on Stone Mountain, Georgia. Uh, there is talk of removing the sculpture on uh, Stone Mountain uh, today. And so this coin, as you can see, shows uh, two Confederate soldiers, uh, Robert E. Lee uh, being one of them. And um, this reflects the uh, sculpture on Stone Mountain. Now, originally, this coin was supposed to be um, for to commemorate or to talk about the death of Warren Harding, but Warren doesn't appear on this coin in any shape or fashion. So what you have here is the uh, Stone Mountain commemorative. Now, back then, um, there was a little bit of talk about commemorating uh, Confederate soldiers, but it wasn't um, that bad. I would think that today, um, you know, with that there would probably be much more concern about a coin being minted. And, and I'm sure that in today's world uh, that this coin would never have been minted um, if, if we were to try to do so today. Well, what really spelled the death knell of the classic commemorative series were that there were just too many subjects. Some collectors and the populace in general lost interest in commemorative coins. 19 commemorative half dollars were issued with the date of 1936 alone. Let that sink in. 19 different commemorative half dollars were available in the year 1936. In 1954, the classic series ended with the Carver Washington half dollar. And there you can see Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. What's particularly interesting about this coin is that it was minted for a specific reason, um, not only to commemorate these two gentlemen, but it was also supposed to, the money that was collected for the sale of this coin was, and, and this is, I'm quoting here, uh, this was supposed to uh, prevent Negroes, they said, from um, believing in uh, communism. So it was to educate Negroes again on, on the evils of communism. That's what was written in the legislation um, to have this coin minted. So now that we spent a little bit of time talking about the uh, classic series, let's move on to the modern commemorative series. In 1982, the Mint began to issue commemorative coins again Legislation now restricts more than two subjects per year so that we do not run into the same problem as in 1936. And this is the very first coin of the modern uh, commemoratives. It was issued to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the birth of, of George Washington. And here you can see on the reverse is Mount Vernon. And you can see George on the obverse uh, on his horse. I believe his horse was named Nelson. Um, and uh, there you can see uh, the very first of the modern commemorative series. And this particular coin did sell very well. Some modern commemoratives have sold well. Uh, here's an example of, of a coin that did. Uh, it's, it's the Boy Scouts of America Centennial that was minted in 2010. 
was very popular. A lot of scouts decided that they wanted the coin. And so uh, it was issued and, and was very popular. Congress and the men have worked to make modern commemorative subjects more inclusive. Here's an example. This is the commemorative dollar uh, that uh, celebrates women in military service. And uh, this was issued in 1994. And, and what you'll see is that with the modern commemorative series, um, a, a big difference from the classic series is that the classic series mostly stuck to the half dollar denomination where the modern commemorative series, while they have issued gold coins and they have issued um, half dollar commemoratives, you're gonna find that the vast majority of the modern commemoratives are in the dollar denomination. And this is an example of that. Here's another example of a woman appearing on a United States coin. This is the Dolly Madison commemorative that was issued in 1999. What's interesting about this particular uh, dollar coin is that the design was actually um, put forth by the Tiffany company. And so you can see it's quite ornate. Um, this was a fairly popular uh, commemorative coin as well. This, this sold pretty well. Uh, here's another example of how the Mint and our federal government has worked to make our commemorative coins more inclusive. This is the Black Revolutionary War Patriots coin in 1998. And uh, this coin features Christmas addicts. Uh, Christmas addicts played an integral role and was killed at the uh, Boston Massacre. And uh, so this, this, um, this particular coin did not sell as well as others. Um, but it is a significant coin. I tend to believe that as numismatists, we tend to think of commemorative coins as an end result, as, as I explained before. You know, we collect them and we may sp spend a little bit of time learning about the event or the person that was commemorated on the coin, which is only natural. But really, uh, it's not a means to an end. There's much more involved in having a commemorative coin made. And I thought that I would offer this presentation, uh, even though I'm not uniquely um, uh, responsible for having a commemorative coin made, but I was involved in, in having a coin made. And so I wanted, to, um, I wanted you to be able to benefit from the things that I learned. And I learned a great deal. Um, in trying to get a commemorative coin made. So the story begins uh, on Memorial Day back in 2010. And I was home on Memorial Day. And um, one of the things that I like to do just to pass time is I like to look at old movies. I like to look at old um, historical video footage. That's just something I enjoy doing to pass the time. And so on that day in 2010, I was um, looking at some footage of uh, things that were happening during the time period of the First World War, uh, which because really uh, the First World War is um, one in which you can see actual events happening. You can see the rulers of the countries moving around. You can't hear them because they up to that time, they, they didn't link video, um, video with audio. But um, it was still fascinating to see. Now, uh, I've actually, since that time, seen a little bit, very brief footage of, um, uh, for example, the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War. But the film's very grainy. It's, it's, it's not very good quality at all. Uh, this was really the first historical event major historical event that the world was involved in, the First World War, in which you can see uh, things happening. And so I was watching that and it got me to think, you know, we have a rich history in commemorative war coins. There was the Black Revolutionary War Patriots that we looked at just a moment ago. Um, there was the Star Spangled Banner, which sort of um, uh, reminds us of the War of 1812. Now, that's this particular coin 
wasn't minted yet because if you remember i said that the, i was spending time back in 2010 and this coin wasn't minted until 2012 um, to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the war of 1812 but i knew it was in the pipeline i i knew that it was um, going to be made so i was aware of that we have a plethora of civil war commemorative coins uh, both in the classic and the modern commemorative series there it was the 50th anniversary of World War II. The Korean War Memorial dollar commemorative coin and even the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, commemorative coin. All of these coins had been minted and it dawned on me. I, I gave some thought and I said, you know, I don't remember a World War I coin being minted. And I thought and I thought about it and I just couldn't come up with one in my head. So then I had my trusty red book and I looked through the red book for the modern commemorative series. And sure enough, one wasn't listed. And I thought to myself, boy, that's odd because you, know, you would think that somewhere along the line, someone would have wanted to sort of commemorate uh, the veterans of the first world war. And I know that other countries were working to do that, but I had heard nothing of, from the United States, uh, from the US men, and that intrigued me. So the first thing I decided to do after I determined that there weren't any World War I commemorative coins from the United States, I wondered to myself, were there any veterans who were left from the uh, First World War who were still alive in 2010? And there were. Um, there was a man named Claude Scholes, and he uh, served for Australia during the war. There also was a woman named Florence Green who served in Great Britain as a nurse during the war, which certainly should count. And I got to thinking, I said, geez, you know, I wonder if there's any, any Americans from the war who were still alive. And as a matter of fact, I found that there was, and there was only one. And uh, hold on one second, please. And his name was Frank Buckles. Frank Buckles was from West Virginia and he was still alive in 2010. And uh, uh, that intrigued me a great deal. Well, this is Frank Buckles. He actually lied to get into the military at the age of 16. He served driving ambulances and motorcycles, transporting injured soldiers from the front line. And this was a picture of him um, right around the 2010 year. Uh, not only was he a um, World War, the last World War I veteran from the United States, but he was involved in something very important. He was um, part of the World War I Memorial Foundation. And he was working at the age of 110. He was working to get a national memorial for World War I veterans. And it's fa it was fascinating to me that there really was no official World War I memorial. Now there is a memorial um, about World War I at the World War I museum in Kansas City. And it's a, it's a wonderful memorial, but it, it doesn't have the moniker of being an official memorial. And so what, uh, what um, Frank Buckles did is he traveled to Washington, D.C. for a couple of reasons. He wanted to take a look at the World War I memorial that is, uh, that does exist in Washington, D.C. But what he found out was that the memorial was dedicated to uh, DC citizens who had fought in the war only. So it was not a national memorial. And he also noticed that it was in pretty bad disrepair and he was saddened about that. So he actually had an opportunity to talk with congressmen. And he had an actual uh, opportunity to speak with the president and talk about how it was so important in his view to be able to have a national memorial in Washington, D.C. on the mall uh, to uh, honor World War I veterans.
So after finding out that information, I decided that, well, you know, maybe we could get a World War I coin minted. And uh, I, I thought about that for, for two reasons. I thought, you know, um, here Frank Buckles at the age of 110 is, is fighting the fight to remember the veterans. So I'm sure that he would be in favor of having a World War I coin minted. And also, you know, the money, the money in uh, the sale of the coin, maybe it could be used to um, help build a memorial on the mall in Washington, DC. And I thought that that would be something that he would appreciate. And I was working under a couple of suppositions. One is that everyone would be in favor of minting a World War coin. How, how could that not be? I mean, how would there, there be anyone who would be offended by minting a World War I coin? Um, commemorating an event is the most important requirement for a commemorative coin. So I was thinking, you know, something like this would probably sail through Congress. Uh, who would be against doing something like this? And that writing the legislation to have a commemorative coin minted, you know, finding a congressman or finding a senator who would be able to do that um, couldn't be that difficult. I mean, who, who would not want to do that? And so I was working under these suppositions, figuring that it wasn't going to be that hard to have this done. Basically, what I figured was I just have to let somebody know that, hey, we haven't done this yet. And it's probably a good idea if we do. Well, the truth was there were many people not in favor of minting a World War I commemorative coin. Um, and I heard them all. Um, number one um, on the list was um, there were people who said we should not celebrate war on a coin. And I tried to convince these people by saying, you know, that's really not what we're trying to do. Um, we're not trying to celebrate war. We're trying to honor the veterans who gave their last full measure who participated in the war. That, that's what we're trying to do. I heard from people who said, well, it will cost taxpayers uh, a fortune to do this. And I had to educate these folks and saying, it actually won't cost uh, taxpayers one dime. Um, what happens is that once legislation is passed, the Mint figures out how much money it's going to cost to make the coins. They figure out how much money it's going to cost to um, let people know that the coins are available. And then there is, they also have to figure out how much money is going to be paid to an organization um, to help them from the sale of the coins. So uh, really, it, it doesn't cost the taxpayers anything. So we really had to educate people as to that. And then I actually had a few people, and I don't understand this one at all, saying that all the soldiers are dead, so who cares? Well, you know, not all the soldiers were dead, number one. And, you know, the fact that uh, even if all the soldiers were dead, um, you know, history dictates that we should be able to remember the people who participated in the war and that, um, you know, there are certainly relatives whose grandfathers and so on had, had fought in the war and that they would appreciate that very much. So believe it or not, the most important, the most important job in commemorating a coin, a uh, commemorating event is, um, where the money's going to go. Uh, believe it or not, that's the most important uh, thing that has to be done. You know, where is the money who, that is going to be uh, garnered from the sale of the coin? Where is it going? And um, I found that out the hard way. And that was, very, that was something I had no consideration for. Um, and what I found out was that with modern commemoratives, um, there is uh, money that is put aside from each individual coin. And for an organization to get that money, they first have to match that perceived amount from private sources. And then once they have got that money, they are then able to receive the money from the sale of the coins. So that was very interesting to me. And, um, 
at that time, I was in touch with a congressman who had indicated that he might be willing to help me with this. And he, one of the first things they wanted to know was, how many coins um, should we be interested in minting? And at that point, I said that I thought, based on previous modern commemorative coins, that a, uh, we should look at 350,000, which was a rather healthy number. But to be honest, there were other commemoratives that had been more ambitious. And what generally happened was they didn't reach their goal of selling out. And I didn't want that necessarily to happen, or if it did, not by much with the World War I commemorative coin. So I thought that a 350,000 total would probably be a good number. Now, it was decided at that point that the men said, well, with that number of coins, um, and we're going to write legislation that about $10 from each coin would seem to be a, a reasonable amount. So with that, some quick math showed me that if 350,000 coins were minted, um, that means that we would be able to donate $3.5 million towards a memorial. So I thought, well, that, that's a pretty good idea. So my next step was I have to find an organization who is, number one, willing to accept that amount of money. And I know you're probably thinking, why wouldn't they want to? But also, of course, they would have to be um, willing to find sources to match that amount so that they would get it. So the first place that I went to was the World War I Museum. And I actually talked to the folks at the World War I Museum. And I told them, listen, you know, we, we, um, I'm, I'm working with Congress to try to get this coin minted. I think it's a natural fit uh, for the World War I Museum. Would you be interested in receiving the funds? I explained to them that you had to match the funds, but would you be interested in receiving it? And I certainly don't want to um, alienate anyone from the World War I Museum, especially now, because it was much, um, the, the people that I spoke to then uh, are, are no longer there, most of them. And so it's, it's a new staff, but they didn't treat me very favorably. And um, they told me that the only way that they would be interested in doing this was if the coin showed the monument there at the museum. And I told them that I didn't have the power to, to guarantee that, uh, that it probably wouldn't happen. And that personally, even though, uh, you know, it's that, that monument is, a, is, is wonderful, that, that would not be my first choice for to appear on the coin anyway. And so they uh, politely but firmly dismissed me from um, the museum and, and any further talks. So then I went to an organization which was called the World War I Memorial Foundation. And what their goal was, was to try to raise money to get a uh, memorial on the mall to commemorate World War I soldiers. And I thought, wow, this is, this is the perfect fit. This is exactly what I want. And this is exactly what uh, I would imagine Frank Buckles would want. And so I, I, I dealt with them. Well, the only problem with the Memorial Foundation is that they, they thought that this was a great idea. They were more than happy to be willing to accept the money. But the problem was they were having some very difficult time in getting a memorial um, plan for the mall. And the reason was that the, there was a, um, uh, on the mall, there was an agreement that no more memorials were going to be built at the mall, that they were running out of room. And so they were in this desperate fight to have this happen. And um, they were losing the fight. And eventually the World War I Memorial Foundation sort of disbanded. And I thought at this point all was lost. And then I heard that the federal government was um, putting together a World War I Centennial Commission. And their job was to educate people uh, about World War I across the nation um, when the centennial came, and that they were also interested in having a memorial made, not necessarily on the mall, but perhaps close to it, 
Um, and they were kind of looking at Pershing Park, which is not too far from the mall, within walking distance, but it's not at the mall itself. So I had really had no other options. So I contacted the World War I Centennial Commission and I said, you know, these are my plans. Um, this is what I'm trying to do. If uh, you would, would you be interested in receiving the money from the sale of the Centennial coin? And they were very um, interested in, in having that happen. And so it, an agreement was uh, made between myself and the World War I Centennial Commission that you know, I would, um, if I was involved in writing the legislation that I would indeed um, include this Centennial Commission as being the benefactor of the money that would be garnered from the sale of the coin. So I figured, you know, as I mentioned before, the legislation couldn't be that difficult to pass, could it? Well, yes, it was. <clears throat> no one wants to expend their political capital um, in the country on a coin. So you just had very few people who uh, were interested in leading the fight and actually working towards having a, um, a coin made. And um, fortunately, very fortunately, um, the, the congressman in the district of where the American Numismatic Association sits actually was interested. And uh, we had several talks and he, to, to my great glee, was willing to um, put legislation forward to have a commemorative coin for the First World War minted. What I learned is that uh, congressmen and senators, they're very busy people. They're not always available. And I was a public teacher before I worked at the ANA, and I learned a very important lesson while I was teaching. And it's that school secretaries and custodians are the most important people in a school. They are the ones that get things done. And so what I learned from that is that when I'm working with a senator or a congressman, the it's key to get their staff involved and get them to really believe in the project because they are the ones who are the shakers and movers they are the ones who remind the congressmen and women and the senators about what's going on and if you can get them involved they are the ones who will help you and lead the fight i learned that you have to be assertive yet patient i mean you don't want to nag and get to the point where they're tired of hearing from you um but, and so you do have to be patient, but you have to stay in their minds. Uh, it's, it's a tightrope you have to walk. And um, as the education director, I used every bit of my ANA capital, capital writing the legislation. Um, the congressman that I worked with asked me if I, would be, uh, if I would be willing to help write the legislation because Congress people are not uh, numismatists, generally speaking. And I told them that I would be honored to do so. And so I worked with them in writing the legislation. What I learned was that there was a two per coin year rule. And what that means is that every year, only two subjects can be chosen for coins to be minted. And so when people learn that, they put coins out in the, um, well out in the future. And, um, you know, in 2010, by this time had already come and gone. And so I was figuring we need to get this done because even though it was 2011 or 12 or whatever at that time, you know, the, um, the coins, the subjects had already been chosen for quite a few years out. And uh, so I knew that we had to kind of step on this to get this done because, believe it or not, the uh, wheels of government grind slowly. And uh, I, also I also know that one of the groups that is very important in helping to choose a uh, commemorative coin is the advisory committee and commission and commission of fine arts, um, two groups. And so I needed to win over both the advisory coinage advisory committee and the commission of fine arts. So I had a lot of work to do. Well, um, I was able to help uh, Congress uh, with writing the legislation, and um, it was interesting because there's a uh, there's an actual website that when new bills are introduced, they'll tell you what it, the um, 
what's the favorability of that being passed? And I, and I remember this like it was yesterday. I looked that up and when the World War I uh, commemorative coin legislation was first written and introduced, there was a 2% chance of it actually passing. And um, I remember going home to my wife almost daily and saying, it's just not gonna happen. You know? And she would say, but you put in all this work. And I said, yeah, but it's just not gonna happen. Um, but finally the legislation was written and it passed both uh, the House and it passed both the Senate and it passed the Senate. And uh, the legislation was signed by then President Obama in 2015. And um, I remember when that happened, it was in December of 2015 and I was a very happy guy. This is the coin um, that you're looking at that was minted in 2018. Now I didn't have any role to play in the design of the coin. Um, the obverse of the coin would not have been my first choice, but I must tell you, I did very much like the reverse of the coin. You'll see there barbed wire and you'll see poppies, poppies being the flower that uh, really when it started in World War I was the flower to remember um, our veterans who had given their last full measure. So I, I thought that the reverse was, was excellent. I love the reverse very much. Well, um, in 2017, the uh, men contacted me and they said, Rod, we know that you were kind of uh, influential in having the coin made. We're going to have this celebration with congressmen and senators who were involved in uh, having the um, legislation passed. Um, would you be interested in coming to the Mint in Philadelphia and, um, you know, taking part in the celebration? Well, I can't tell you how honored I was for, for that to happen. And I uh, readily agreed to come. And so this picture you see of me um, actually minting one of the commemorative coins. Um, I was hoping, you know, in my wildest dreams to actually be the first person to mint one of the coins, but I wasn't. But I was minted number 10. Um, which I thought was a huge honor. And uh, uh, it, it was part of one of the biggest honors of my life. Oh, I'm sorry. Here I am with the mint worker who helped me and uh, showing the coin that I had just minted. And uh, th that was a very big moment. He was a very nice gentleman. And so I thought to myself, um, you know, uh, two things. Number one, was I going to get, could I keep the coin that I minted? That was my first question. And the other question I had was the coin, the very first coin, um, who should get it? And there were several people who I thought would be an honor. First would be Congressman Doug Lamborn. Congressman Lamborn was the person who I had worked with and who introduced the legislation on the, uh, on the um, House side. And we could not have done it without Congressman Lamborn's help. So he was certainly in the running. Um, could it be the ANA? Um, you know, I, I think that would be a suitable place to have the coin. Um, I even thought, you know, maybe I get to get the very first coin. Wouldn't that be neat? Uh, but my personal favorite was uh, Susan Buckles. Frank Buckles had passed away um, by the time the coin was minted, but his daughter, who was very much involved in the fight to get a uh, a uh, commemorative coin issued and a memorial. Um, I thought that my personal selection would be Susan. Well, it so happened that um, Susan did not get the first coin. I don't remember who it was who, who did get the first coin that was minted. Um, but what happened was when I asked the uh, mint, you know, can I take this coin home with me? They said, they were very nice. They said, no, Unfortunately, we can't let it. We can't let you take it with you because that um, we it's really not. We don't consider it legal tender until the coin actually goes for on for sale, and we have it scheduled for going on sale in January. Well, like I said, this was November, and I thought to myself, well, uh, January is not too far off, so I can certainly wait. Um, and they said, promised me that they would notify me when the coin was available to me. So January came. And the phone call came and uh, the men said, hey, Rod, you know, we want you to know that we um, have the coin and the, the one that you minted and we're ready to send it to you. And 
And I thought, oh, that is so cool. And they said, and we will send it to you as soon as you send in the $53.95 for the price of the coin. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, I had worked for five years of my life to get this coin minted. And you'd think that uh, I might be able to get one, but, um, you know, they told me it was, that's what I needed. So I, I sent in the money um, and had the coin made. Uh, and had the coin sent, excuse me. So when it came, I decided that um, because it was the 10th coin that was minted, which is pretty neat, uh, I was going to uh, donate it to the American Numismatic Association. And it so happens that at the time, our museum director, uh, Doug Mudd, we were building a main exhibit called Trenches to Treaties and of World War I. And so I thought, wow, this will be great because, you know, the ANA will be able to use this coin in part of the exhibit. And I donated it to them. And then what I did is I bought a coin just out of the general mintage um, for myself. But what we were doing was something that was really unique. Um, I called up and, and had an, an interesting conversation with the gentleman who was working with the family of Frank Buckles. And um, he told me, he said, you know, I have Frank's cap that was used during the First World War. And I actually have a picture of Frank wearing the cap. And would you be interested in including that in your exhibit? And I couldn't believe it. And I said, oh, would I? And so he very kindly on loan sent us the cap and the picture of Frank, which you see now. And we were able to put that with the uh, example obverse and reverse of the World War I coin. So I'm sure that even though Frank was not around, he would be very pleased to have seen the World War I coin and his cap and picture on display for all to see, um, which, is, is what, um, which is what we did. The final part of the puzzle is that um, the World War I monument is b currently being built. Um, it's at Pershing Park, uh, not on the mall. And I, I have to tell you, I'm disappointed that it's not on the mall because I think that, um, you know, World War I, it's sort of interesting. Being a public school teacher, we don't necessarily do a very good job about teaching the implications of the First World War. And I think that at the best, students may remember that they seeing these men, um, you know, on this pocked moonscape field, and they're all moving really quickly um, because the speed of the of the film is different, and that's probably all they remember. <clears throat> and really, there's much more to the war that my grandfather uh, actually fought in the war, and I remember that um, the thing most interesting I found most interesting about him is he never wanted to go anywhere. Uh, he never wanted to go anywhere on vacations. He wanted just to stay home. And I remember asking him once, you know, grand, or granddad, why is it that you don't want to travel anywhere? And he told me that he had traveled to France during the war. And uh, that was enough travel to last him a lifetime. So it did affect people. You know, World War I was, it was the very first time that America served on a world stage and, and was a world power. And, and and affect people for generations. So I, I'm I'm really happy that the coin was made, and I'm really happy that even though the memorial won't be on the mall, that it will be around in Pershing Park, and then people will see it and observe it and perhaps learn from it. So that's kind of what is involved in making a commemorative coin in today's world. So hopefully you've got a little bit of appreciation that it just doesn't happen on its own that there's a lot of work and involved and that a, a lot of people put forth ideas for commemorative coins to be made and um, few are chosen. And so that's what happens. Andy, um, if there are any folks that have, a, I know we have about six minutes and if there are any folks who have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, thanks for that great presentation, Rod. Uh, let's take some questions, shall we? Uh, here's something for you, Rod. I'm, I'm interested to hear this as well. In your career as a numismatist, where does the World War I coin experience rank for you? Wow, that's a really nice question. And, and I have to tell you, it really hit home for me 
I was really anxious when I saw the coin in the Red Book because I felt, wow, this, you know, this, this was a big deal for me. So the fact that I was fortunate enough to have a, a role to play, um, certainly I'm not the only one. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that there were so many people who were involved in having that coin minted that I, I could spend all day trying to remember everyone who was involved and thanking them. But with that being said, um, that probably is the, the biggest thrill for me um, being um, a, a numismatist is, is working to have a coin, an actual coin minted. Uh, someone, I, I think I know a little bit about this. Someone's asking about uh, the pan, the pan packs of uh, 1915 and what role Fair and Zerby played in their production. Um, go, ahead. I think, go ahead, Rod, sorry. No, no, please go ahead, Andy. You, well, you probably know more I, than I, I do I, on this. I think he, he, he served as like chief numismatist for a couple of world's fairs, including the San Francisco World's Fair of 1915. So I believe that he did play a role in the pan packs and what mm -hmm. coins were created, um, you know, the, the octagonals and all that kind of stuff. Um, so as to the size of the role that he played, I'm not sure, but I do know that he, he was involved in the, in the pan pack and the creation of those coins. Yeah, you know, Andy, I really don't have anything to add to that. I think what you said is, is basically all that I know. So you did a great job. Um, the one thing I want to add is that there were a lot of people, and I didn't mention this, there were a lot of people who said, well, we already have a commemorative, we already had a commemorative coin. And um, they're talking about the peace dollars that were minted. And first of all, peace dollars aren't, even though the original legislation for them was to be a commemorative coin, peace dollars weren't commemorative coins because to me, the definition of a coin being a commemorative coin is that it, their uh, proceeds from the sale of the coin has to go somewhere. And that didn't happen with the peace dollars. So that, that's number one. And number two, the subject of the peace dollars was the peace after the First World War, which really did nothing to honor the veterans who had participated in the war. So even though that's a, an opinion of some people, and they're certainly, you know, uh, welcome to their own opinion, that's not something that I believe is true. interesting question did all of the classic commems have to go through the same uh, kind of experience that you went through uh, in that you kind of underestimated what the process was going to entail and all that thank you so much for that question because that leads to something that i've forgotten to mention to you folks um the answer is no um it was complete the it was completely different back then um as opposed to today which is in one way why I think that um, we got into trouble with so many different commemorative coins being made. To find out um, about the subject of each commemorative coin and about the history behind how the coin was made, um, I have this for you. If you were interested today in having a coin made, you must convince a senator or congressperson that you have a suitable subject um, to be commemorated. It is best to become acquainted with the senator or congressperson staff as they do the heavy lifting. Most important, you must find a suitable and willing association who will work to accept the money. And you must, um, as many people involved, you must include as many people involved so that they can contact their representatives. You must be persistent and all the above must be done early as you have a narrow time limit. Now, if you wanna learn more about the classic series and why they were minted and the subject behind them, we have a really neat website on the ANA website about the classic series in their entirety. And it starts off with the Columbian Exposition coins and works all the way to the um, uh, Washington Carver half dollar. So if you're interested in the commemorative series and you want to know why they were made and the information behind them, if you will go to our website on the uh, 
on the commemorative coins classic series, you'll find all that information. Andy, thank you so much for bringing that up. I would have forgotten. Well, no, it's uh, someone following along here. It was a good question. Uh, yeah, I can piggyback on uh, Rod's uh, page that he put together, pages that he put together on the commemorative series. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It discusses kind of the information of the coin, some of the things that were going on in the country when the coin was minted. Uh, it's very educational and very fun. So definitely check out our commemorative uh, classic MM series on our website, money.org. Oh, here's another interesting question. Are the 2021 Peace and Morgan dollars that are coming out, are they considered commemoratives? That's a great question. And the answer is, as far as I, as far as I understand, now I haven't looked at um, it recently, but as far as I understand, the answer is no. That even though they are coins that are, um, that are not to be uh, spent, although they are legal tender, they aren't. They don't fulfill the uh, classic idea of being a commemorative coin um, because uh, I don't believe that um, I, I don't believe that their their money is the money is going to anywhere. And I, as a matter of fact, I think that in the legislation for those dollars, they mention that they are not considered commemorative coins. Plus, I've heard that they're going to make them for several years, not just um, commemorating the 100th anniversary. So um, I don't think that they meet the strict commemorative coin legislation. I don't believe in the legislation they're listed as commemorative coins. I could be wrong about that, but, but I, in my last reading of that, that's what I understand. We have a former president, uh, a and president here talking about uh, he, con he contacted his senators about a commemorative uh, for those who uh, were frontline in the coronavirus um, and has not heard of anything. So um, I guess Rod put it best, be persistent, right? Yeah, um, you know, you really have to be persistent because um, uh, the senators and Congress people, you know, I know that they're very busy and um, but really working to have, and, it, and it's hard work, working to convince your fellow legislators to buy into having a commemorative coin minted is, is not the easiest of tasks. So I understand why, um, you know, they, they don't always want to um, help you with that. They don't want to spend their uh, political capital because really with this, you, it needs to be bipartisan. You really need to have the legislation be bipartisan for it to be successful. The funny thing about it is once it gets to the floor, see the hard part is getting it to the floor. It has to come out of committee and it's the House Finance Committee, I believe, that's responsible. It has to come out of committee. And once it comes out of committee and you have several people, Congress people who are aware of it and sign on to it, then it has a chance. It's actually getting it to that point that is the hard part. Once you get it to that point, then you have a fighting chance for it to move forward. But, but again, it, you know, the devil's in the details and, and it's, it's the hard part is actually getting, out, getting it out of committee. Well, Rod, that was uh, very interesting. Thank you. Um, and thanks for your efforts in making the coin a reality. I agree with you that the, uh, the obverse isn't my favor. I really like that reverse though. No, I want to thank everyone. Andy, I want to thank you for being the host. And I want to thank everybody for taking some of their busy time to spend it with me. And I hope you enjoyed our presentation. And I hope that you'll visit our um, webpage on the classic series. I think that you'll, it's a lot of fun, as Andy said, and I think that you'll enjoy it a great deal. And just to plug uh, one other thing from our online offerings, everyone, if you're into World War I, our last exhibit before uh, before our one currently was on the money of World War One to sell or to commemorate its hundredth anniversary. Uh, so we have a virtual exhibit on our uh, on online in our money museum uh, category, I guess. So if you're interested in learning more about the money of World War One, definitely check that out. It was fun to put together. A lot of good information there too. Thank you, Andy. All right, everyone. 
thank you for joining us at the ANA's eLearning Academy. Once again, I'd like to thank the Gray Sheet for their continued support of our e-learning offerings and make sure to check our e-learning academy offerings, offerings um, uh, regularly because we're, we're always kind of putting together new stuff on a wide, uh, wide array of options, uh, world coinage, US coinage, errors, uh, paper money, anything that you're interested in will likely have something come up, coming up in the near future. So again, thanks everyone and have a good day.